Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Sergeyev. I'm a fire prevention technician on the Mount Pinos Ranger District of the Los Padres National Forest. I'm happy to be here today, and we're going to talk a little bit about wildfires and wildfire behavior. So let's get started. And we have a video and see if this is going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Oh. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. We can edit that out, so don't worry. You're back. Okay, so the first section we're gonna talk about is wildfires. Um, the first thing to know about wildfires is fires uh, require uh, three things to exist, and that's oxygen, fuel, and heat. Um, that creates the fire triangle. There's different types of wildfires. Um, there are good uh, versus bad wildfires. Good wildfires are prescribed burning and naturally occurring wildfires and they're part of the ecosystem and benefit the forest. Bad wildfires are human-caused wildfires that burn fields, grass, brush, or forest. Wildfires affect wildlife, humans and pets, watersheds, forest and plants, and personal property. When is California's wildfire season? Well, we used to have a wildfire season, which typically would end in the uh, when the winter would begin into early spring. But uh, anymore, California's wildfire season is pretty much a year round thing now. The California wild season, wildfire season is now considered to be year round with the peak months being between July through October. And you can see by the chart here, Uh, wildfires have burned more state acres in 2020 than any other year on record. And you can see it's pretty drastic, uh, much lower uh, when they were started tracking this in the uh, 1990s. And uh, a little spike around 2000. And then just before 2010, quite a big um, spike up. And then uh, recently, as far as 2020, um, we've been seeing some real record wildfires uh, the last few years. Why are wildfires in the summer and fall? Well, there's a number of reasons, as you can see from the slide here. Um, uh, direct sunlight, um, direct sunlight um, affects wildfires because the more sun um, that uh, hits and shines on uh, the vegetation uh, and the fuels, it uh, tends to dry those fuels and vegetation out faster so that uh, allows uh, wildfire starts to start easier and burn more aggressively. Um, obviously, weather conditions, uh, hot and dry conditions, um, temperatures and relative humidities, uh, and also fuel moistures uh, all uh, affect uh, wildfires, and that's why they are um, they burn more and more aggressively in the summer and fall. Um, drier limbs and brush. Um, thunderstorms, they occur more during the summer and fall than the rest of the year. And then, of course, human activity, um, just being that um, summer and fall uh, temperatures are better, and so people are a lot more active 
um, out and about doing things in the yard or out in the forest or where or wherever. A wildfire behavior. So kind of like the fire um, triangle, we have a wildfire behavior triangle. And there's three components to it, as you can see, uh, weather, fuel, and topography. So um, fuel is the um, is basically, it's obviously the fuel that burns in a fire. So it's uh, the amount, uh, the arrangement, and the moisture. So uh, the amount, I think, is uh, pretty obvious how much of it um, there is present. Uh, arrangement has to do with how the fuel is arranged. So um, depends on the type of fuel and um, and how it's arranged. Um, you know, is it um, patches of brush or is it a large area of brush? Is it a forest that's thick and crowded with trees that uh, that touch each other or close to each other that continue for a long um, area, or is it more sporadic? And then the moisture um, has to do with the, the fuel moisture and the relative humidity, uh, like we talked about. Um, the topography is basically the terrain. So it's the slope or the aspect of the land. So the slope is, um, is basically the, the, the hill or the angle of the hill. And then the aspect is um, basically the direction that that hill faces. And that's important because um, that um, has to do with how the sun hits it. So if the sun is hitting the um, the aspect or the side of the hill um, that has the the sun on it for the most uh, the majority of the day, um, fire is going to act differently there than it is on the other side of the slope uh, because the uh, the fuel is going to be different because that slope is going to be hotter and drier. So what grows there is going to be um, different than a shadier or wet or wetter side. And then it's also fire behavior is going to act differently on um, the sunny side of the slope um, because it is going to be hotter and drier and the humidity is going to be less and the fuels are going to be drier. And the last, temp uh, the last part of the wildfire behavior triangle is weather. Uh, which is wind, temperature, humidity, and precipitation. Um, all of these things affect uh, fire starts and fire behavior. Uh, wind uh, definitely affects uh, fire because of a lot of fire can be um, wind-driven. Um, temperature uh, affects because um, temperature directly correlates uh, with the, how dry the fuel is and the humidity of uh, the fuel. Um, the humidity and the and then the precipitation, which is the rain uh, and the snow. <clears throat> uh, we have different types of fuel types. Um, the fuel types are grass, leaves, pine needles, twigs, uh, branches and logs, and personal property. And uh, personal property uh, can be anything really. It can be the fence in your yard. It can be your car that's parked out back. It could be. Uh, your wood pile or um, anything like that. Uh, continuing with weather, um, relative humidity, um, temperature, wind, and precipitation, um, they all affect uh, fire uh, starts and fire behavior as we um, just previously talked about. Here's the topography again, slope, aspect, Saddle, ridge top, canyon, flatland, chimneys, and chutes. So we already talked about slope and aspect, uh, but one further um, note on slope is that um, fire behavior, um, fire tends to run faster uh, uphill. So that's how slope affects uh, fire with, to with topography. Um, the saddle is uh, kind of in the same thing. Um, but saddle is, it's, um, I don't know if anybody can see the pointer in my presentation, but it's the saddle is, it's like the saddle on a horse. It's this little curved area on a ridge top. And um, saddles uh, uh, affect uh, fire because fire tends to rapidly uh, burn upslope. Um, and then it tends to run through these saddle areas. Um, canyons are, are the same thing. Um, 
fire tends to run up through canyons um, upslope and a lot of times wind affects that because wind will um, tend to blow fire up through canyons. Uh, flat land is um, a little different and fire acts a lot different on flat land because it's not affected by that topography. Um, although flat land can be um, affected by wind. So if anybody is in or around Antelope Valley, you probably know about that. So although it's flat, fire can move very rapidly if it has a wind um, pushing behind it. And chimneys and chutes, um, those are just the, um, the depressions or the areas in the slopes that, the, again, the fire uh, will run rapidly up, uh, up those chimneys and, and chutes. It'll run up to the top of the slopes uh, in those areas. Uh, this graph is uh, the greatest wildfire risk, and it's talking about the time of day. So if you look at it, um, the incidents are very low from um, midnight till, oh, about six. And um, this is depicting the sunrise just before six. And as you can see, as the sun rises, um, the fire activity uh, and risk starts to pick up. And um, it starts to pick up mostly around um, noon. And then it's greatest in the afternoon till about five or six o'clock. And uh, the reason for this are the things that we um, just discussed. Um, it has to do a lot with the, the fuels, um, the relative humidities um, and the fuel moistures and the temperatures and weather conditions. So those are all affected by the time of day. And some of those things vary um, throughout the day, depending on the time of day, because the more that the sun um, is, uh, is out on fuels, the more that it tends to dry it out and the more that it lowers the relative humidity. So the drier the fuel is and the lower the relative humidity is, um, the easier it is for those fires to, to have a start and to get going. Okay, uh, so next we have a scenario. Um, what would you do? So the scenario is Marcus invited Brian, his best friend, on a weekend trip with his parents to the local mountains. By the afternoon of the second day, they had an idea. Wouldn't it be cool to set twigs on fire and see who could put out their twig fire the quickest by stomping on it? The two got the lighter from the fireplace mantle in the cabin and took it outside to try their experiment. Uh, what might happen next and what would you change? Does anybody have any comments? Well, this is Don Bear here. <laughs> it's just, 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 just the obvious. What, obvious. What, what stupid people. But yeah, I know that kids don't make good choices. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, a, a concern that I have are the B&Bs here in Pine Mountain. Uh, I was all over one of them. Uh, it was windy. They had charcoal barbecue. Now, it, to me, it looked like wood. But, and so I just flipped out. So I don't think they'll be renting that B&B &B again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, definitely not a good situation. Um, anybody else have any comments? Well, it would seem to me that if they're visitors to the area, that if they do rent an Airbnb or stay someplace, that there should be some information placed in their proximity so that they would be able to read it and realize the seriousness of it um, or a, a warning from the owner, the, you know, because this. Uh, yes, I talked a, to the owner about that. It's a just a tinderbox. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the, the people were arrogant and didn't give a damn, you know. So, I would make the boys go to their room and yeah. put the lighter down. That's what I would do. Sternly. <laughs> yes, that would definitely be the, the right thing to do. So, um, you know, from my perspective, what might happen next? Well, uh, pretty obvious, uh, depending on conditions, what might happen next is they might uh, start something on fire <laughs> and then, uh, I think you guys hit it pretty good um, on what you would change. So um, one thing that I would like to add, um, because my primary job is fire prevention. I spend a lot of time out in the field uh, patrolling, um, but I stop and talk to a lot of folks is that I think a lot of people just aren't aware of um, 
fire behaviors and fire conditions and what could happen. And um, it's just kind of like a lot of people are ignorant. And so um, I, it's just good to try to educate people um, and um, try to teach people on on um, how this works and what happens and, you know, if, if fires happen and what not to do. Um, I actually spent a lot of time doing it um, just for, for that reason. So, okay, so moving on. Does anybody else have any questions or comments before we move on to the next section? I have a quick one. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with the super scoopers that we we lease from Canada. Uh -huh. Do they come up here to Kern County? I believe they do. Um, they're on contract usually during the height of the fire season, um, which kind of works out good. It's usually during the time where uh, Canada doesn't need them as much. And um, I believe uh, they used to house them down in the Lake Elsinore area. Um, and then they are ready to respond to pretty much anywhere uh, in the area if needed. They're amazing. Oh, yeah. So are the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> They're a good thing for sure. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, moving on. How forest fires start? Uh, two categories, natural causes and man-made causes. So we've got a few of them here. I'm sure there's a lot more than it's just on this list. Um, but uh, we'll go through the ones that uh, we have here in front of us. So for natural causes, uh, we have volcanic eruptions. I don't think that's very likely around here, although um, I guess anything could happen. Um, spontaneous fires, um, that actually does happen. And I have run into that in my career. Um, sometimes if fuel and conditions and things are just right, um, they can just spontaneously ignite. Um, it's not super common, um, but it can happen. And where I've seen it usually is, um, I've seen um, piles uh, from wood chippers. Um, I've seen piles spontaneously um, combust, but it usually takes a while. It's usually um, large piles that are um, in a place for a while that are decomposing for a while and they generate quite a bit of heat. And I think it takes um, you know a lot of time and specific conditions for that to happen. Um, underground coal fires, we definitely don't have any of those here. That's something that um, happens where coal um, uh, occurs naturally. So that happens on the East Coast, but um, not here. Um, uh, lightning storms, we do have those here. Um, and so that definitely can um, cause uh, wildfire starts, um, especially in areas like here around Fraser Park, uh, Pine Mountain Club where we have a lot of uh, wooded areas and a lot of uh, fuel. And the weather conditions are such that uh, the thunderstorms will build uh, over the mountains and um, create lightning strikes. So that's um, something that we definitely keep an eye on. Um, rockfall sparks, um, that can be a thing. I don't know how common that is, but um, that can definitely happen. Um, Man-made causes cigarette stubs. Um, that definitely uh, can start a fire. Um, campfires and bonfires, um, most definitely. I spend a lot of time um, patrolling around, keeping an eye on those. Um, and I do a lot of education on those because I find that if I talk to people, um, there's a much greater percentage of people that handle them properly and put them out rather than, um, than not. Uh, equipment related fires, uh, that happens quite a bit. That can happen from um, equipment running that throws sparks. So it could happen from um, a chainsaw running that doesn't have a, uh, a spark arrestor, or maybe a chain blade can hit a piece of metal that's uh, a spike in a tree, or maybe hit a rock or something like that. If the conditions are right, um, that spark can start um, a fire. Um, Catalytic converters and diesel trucks can start fires too. And that's why um, anybody in the area, um, you'll notice that during the summer when it's hot and dry and the fire conditions are really high, um, that you get a lot of vehicle fires um, starting on the five freeway. And they're normally on the up bound side because it's, um, 
It can happen from um, old cars, especially ones that are not um, well maintained. They, um, if they have catalytic converters that go bad, they can actually build up pressure and then blow out parts of the catalytic converter and hot carbon. And if that blows right into the uh, grass, it uh, easily starts a fire. And then some of these older diesel, um, like big rig trucks can do that too. Um, if they're old and not well maintained, um, they tend to build up a lot of soot. And so they heat up uh, pulling up the grade and um, sometimes they blow um, soot and hot carbon out and that um, can start a fire. Um, dragging chains um, happens a lot too on, on people towing trailers. So anybody that tows a trailer, please, please make sure that your, your chain is not dragging on the ground because that can very easily start a fire with the right conditions. Um, arsons is man-made caused fires, um, pretty obvious. And then um, debris clearing, kind of what we already talked about, um, I think um, could be um, spark from a chainsaw or um, hot carbon from exhaust from a piece of equipment or it could be uh, even um, using a tractor or something with a blade if it scrapes and, and throws sparks, it can start a fire. Causes of fire. Most California wildfires are caused by human activity. 95% uh, of wildfires are caused by humans. Um, it's a pretty high percentage. Um, as you can see by the graph there. Um, they only list lightning. Uh, obviously there's all the other um, things that we just talked about, but those are the main um, factors. And, uh, lasting effects of wildfire. Um, we have a uh, loss of human life. That's probably first and foremost, the, the biggest uh, effect of um, lasting effects of wildfire. Um, big catastrophic fires can cause uh, loss of life um, you know, fighting fires is a risk to wild, uh, wildland firefighters, um, and first responders. Um, sometimes landowners, uh, lose their life in fires either by staying home and trying to protect their property, or sometimes people just don't leave. Um, loss of wildlife, um, that happens a lot. Uh, all the little critters that, uh, that we like are, that are in our neighborhood and, uh, around where we live, um, they, uh, they do their best to run away from a wildfire, but uh, some of them just uh, can't run fast enough to get away from these uh, big fires. Uh, destroys our water supply. As we talked about earlier, um, um, big wildfires have a really big effect on, um, on watersheds, and that has a large effect on our water supply because the watersheds obviously feed our water supplies and our aquifers, um, and that's the, that's the water that, uh, that we use to supply our, our homes and our family. And then permanent damage to our forests. Uh, also, as we talked about, um, large fires can um, really damage or sometimes um, completely destroy forests or big sections of them. Okay, this slide, I had to ask uh, one of my coworkers on this because I looked at it and I thought, wow, this looks like tree rings, but I was a little confused about the numbers on it, but um, I think what it is talking about is I think these are just um, dates and I think the arrows are pointing to um, evidence of damage to um, to the trees uh, in wildfire. So if you look at each one of those air arrows, there is, um, there's like a, a section or some part of the wood that is altered or different or um, damaged. So uh, wildfires uh, don't always kill trees. Um, sometimes they damage trees. And so I think that's what uh, is being shown in this slide here. Okay, next section. Before we move on, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, I um, I was around for the day fire in uh, in Pine Mountain, the Pine Mountain area, and part of the pro one of the things they said might have started it because they don't really know um, was a car sitting running uh, on the side of the on the side of the freeway, just running, not making any sparks, but just the heat from the from the exhaust uh, kindled you know, a, a small blaze under the car. The people drove off, probably didn't even know about it. And uh, and it's just, I don't, uh, 
I don't know what else you can do, you know? Yes, that's a great point. And I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you brought that up because um, I should have included that in, in the previous conversation, but um, catalytic converters are another big source of starting wildfires. Um, catalytic converters get very hot. They can run, you know, well over a thousand degrees. And so if they're parked o over um, the right type of fuel, um, dry vegetation, primarily grass, um, they can very easily start a wildfire. So it's very important not to pull off into tall grass um, with a hot car or a running car. And that's one reason that we have rules in place too here on the National Forest, where we don't allow cars to just drive off and park on grass or vegetation or um, any of those type of areas. Yeah, I have a question too that, that's on the chat. Um, you mentioned that uh, piles of stuff like spontaneously combust uh -huh. and um, haystacks can spontaneously combust and compost piles oh, yeah. spontaneously combust. So that's really interesting. And then somebody wants to know about the slash you know, that's very common up here where people will go to the green waste belt waste center and pick up slash mm -hmm. and come and put it on their driveways. Does that combust or does it, is it not like in a pile enough and, but it'll burn, right? If there's a fire come through. Yes. I don't uh, think that would typically um, spontaneously combust unless it was really a large pile of it. Um, but it it is a fuel. So if you did a fire, did if you did have a fire that started that burned up to it, it's just more fuel that would burn in a fire. Okay. So I think the spontaneous combustion is it's really a it's a process of um, uh, organic materials breaking down, which creates heat and um, maybe some other um, byproducts. I'm I'm not an expert on it, but um, as I understand it, it's it's primarily that. Um, that process of breaking of the breaking down of the organic uh, materials that creates a lot of heat, and then um, you get enough of it in the right conditions that can can bake is basically make it uh, combust. Thank you. Oh, and can I just ask, this year because we've had so much moisture and we have so much grow growing right now, and it's going to dry out. It's going to dry out. Would you say this? Would you say that there's a, uh, a, 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 a more of a more of a danger of it as after it dries because there's so much more of the vegetation that's going to be a be a problem? Is that more than normal, or is it just uh, we just handle it as though it's just a regular every year that we clear? I think it's good to just treat every year as if it's a a high danger or, uh, or probability of a fire just to err on the side of caution and to be extra careful. Um, it really depends on conditions and uh, overall conditions, um, but then, you know, conditions change on a daily basis as well. But I will say that um, with more precipitation, um, we do have more grass and light fuel, and that's typically where these um, fires normally get started. So um, with that being said, yes, it is very important to be diligent with the clearance um, and to have adequate clearances and to remove that fine um, light fuel um, and vegetation. Thanks. I've got a question. Sure. <laughs> Don Deere here. Uh, I've, I've used to see control burns in Arizona Flagstaff area. That would always flip me out, but I don't see there aren't really any controlled burns in California, are there? Are there? Um, there are, but they're a real touchy thing these days. Yeah. And there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so um, agencies, entities, we can't just um, burn things. We we have to um, we have to do a lot of planning, and there's environmental oh, yeah. considerations, and um, there's cooperate, you know, other cooperators that uh, have to buy in with it. So there's a lot of things that have to happen, and um, so it takes a long time and a lot of work to kind of make these things happen. And a lot of times um, they do get planned, and these things happen, but then a lot of times they don't happen because the conditions might not be right. So nobody wants to burn. Um, any piles or any vegetation and then have something escape and, and then, um, you know, create a loss of, of, you know, area or forest or properties. 
So yes, there there is burning, but um, it's just not super prevalent because it's a real hard thing to do these days. And Chris, we have a question about what causes fire cyclones. So fire cyclones are caused by um, weather conditions. Um, so it's a lot of things. It's it's air temperature, it's wind, it's ground temperature, it's the fire activity, it's what um, what's going on on the ground. And so um, all, all of these things, um, if they create the right conditions, um, they'll basically can create their own weather. And that's one of the things that they can create. So it basically creates like a vortex and then it makes the the air or the wind around it kind of swirl around. Um, and that's what what causes that. Interesting. And then there's another question here. What did the recent near record storms do to the fire season and the risk? So I think the the record storms brought us a lot of precipitation. And that precipitation is um, it's created a lot of light fuel. So there's a lot of grass growing. I think there's more in some places than I've seen in the last few years. Um, so it creates more of a risk when that, um, dries out and the conditions are right for fire starts because the fire starts typically happen in what we call those light flashy fuels. But on the flip side, I think, um, the precipitation, uh, rain and really particularly the snow, I think is, um, helped, um, our environment and particularly the, the forest in this area because, um, the trees uh, have been very stressed because we've been in a lot of drought for a lot of years. And so they've the trees, I think, have been able to grab a lot of that water and store a lot of that water. And I think that's kind of helping them get a little healthier right now. Um, so, so I think it's kind of both. It's kind of, it creates some hazards, but I think it's kind of created better conditions for a lot of our trees and um, forests to become a little more healthier. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah, definitely. So if anybody else has any questions, you can leave them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, someone asked about the procedures and the requirements for clearing around their property. Okay, that's pretty pretty much dependent on the jurisdiction that you live in. So um, we recommend the more, um, the more clearance you can do around your property, the better. Um, and that's really dependent on your property. But um, typically you want to do um, as much as you can. Um, and you want to remove light flashy fuels from away from your house. So that's going to be grass. Um, light, uh, like pine needles, uh, small branches, twigs, that sort of thing. Um, you want to remove um, anything that could catch fire that's um, adjacent or up against your house. A lot of people like to put um, firewood piles against their house, which is really convenient in the winter, but it's really bad in the summer because if a fire happens and gets into that wood pile, it's going to create enough heat that it's probably going to um, set your house on fire. And then further out, you want to start um, limbing or uh, removing any um, any brush um, that you reasonably can. Um, and you want to limb up any trees that you can because um, we call it ladder fuels. So um, if a fire starts in some light, flashy fuel like the grass that we talk about, um, and it kind of gets established and a flame starts going and it starts burning pretty decent and then and then it hits a pile of pine needles and twigs, you know, that's um, some fuel that's a little bit heavier. Well, the fire is going to get a little more intense, a little bit bigger, and it's going to keep moving. And if that moves next to the big bush that's next to it, catches that on fire, well, now your fire is rapidly getting bigger. Um, and if that bush is uh, right underneath some trees that have low, um, low hanging branches, 
Well, then it's going to catch those branches on fire. And then that tree, that uh, fire is going to move up that tree. And we definitely don't want the fire getting up into the trees because if it gets into the top or what we call the crown of the trees, then um, it'll start going from tree to tree to tree. And if you have any winds on it, then that's when those things kind of start getting real big. So um, that's kind of fire clearance 101 in a nutshell. I, I hope that is, uh, I hope that answers your question. That's great. Yeah. And uh, Joan Kotnick has a question. Joan, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? Are you still there? I'm here. Can y'all hear me? There we yes. go. There we go. Um, at our ranch, we had a fire go through in 2004. And since then, the wild ceanothus with the long two inch thorns has grown everywhere. Uh, in a recent conversation, a friend suggested that the pine trees that are, have receded, that at some point they will grow tall enough, they will actually choke out the ceanothus and cause it to not grow anymore. Any information on that? Yes, yes absolutely. I have some personal experience with that. So I've um, lived in some areas where I've gone through some wildfires and know some history on some fires and that absolutely does happen. Um, so once the trees are gone, um, other species of plants tend to thrive. Um, so Ceanothus is, a, if anybody doesn't know, it's a type of brush. It's a real thorny brush plant and it thrives in full sun. So that's why you don't really see it in forests because when the trees are um, get big and they shade it out, uh, that tends to die out and go away. Um, but one of the challenges is, is when you have a fire and you lose trees or things that provide shade, um, that type of thing takes over. So there's kind of that challenge of trying to get um, shade trees or, or um, other things established um, to um, kind of remove the, that ceanothus because that stuff is real hardy and it just takes over everything. Thank you. Sure. So Chris, earlier you mentioned that um, fire goes quickly up the hill. And yes. recently I heard a firefighter mention that it goes slower when it's coming down the hill and it's easier for them to stop it if it's coming downhill. But what causes that one to be faster than the other? It's just, it's, it's that slope thing and um, fire behavior. And then wind tends to, um, tends to push uphill too. So um, winds, depending on um, the location and the time of day, um, if the winds are right, they will put, they will push fire up slope, which fire likes to run rapidly uphill anyway. So that's why. Okay. So um, you may or may not know this, Chris, but uh, the Kern Fire Safe Council is currently doing um, a home ignition hazard assessment project. Okay. And uh, we're doing a pilot project in Pine Mountain Club. This is where we're starting. And we're working with Team Rubicon to make that happen. And we're assessing the homes and we especially wanna do the older homes um, that came, you know, that were built in the 70s before all the new uh, requirements came through. And um, looking at the things that people can do, the inexpensive things that they can do to harden their homes, which makes a huge difference. I've seen several videos on that. Um, one was actually one of the leaders of Cal Fire did his home and there was a fire that came through and everything was gone but his home. It didn't touch his property at all. It was just amazing to see that. So we're working on that up here. And then uh, we got a grant and we are going to a uh, USDA grant and we're going to do the same project on the entire Fraser Mountain starting over the summer. So we're really excited about that because we hope that that's going to help save yeah. structures and save lives. Julia, I... I'm in Pine Mountain. How do I make sure that my property is assessed? Dawn, you need to go to our website at right. um, kernfiresafe.org. And okay. there's a registration button. Just click on that and fill in the form. Okay, that, that's Kern 
firesafe.org. Yes. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Excellent. And how do I get a referral? Uh, I'm looking at some of my trees and the lower branches are, you know, they really should be taken off. I'm new up here. I've been here well, about two years, but uh, how do I get a referral for someone to do that? Well, uh, there are several sites. Why don't you... Um... Dawn, if you uh, ask that question on our website, there is a place to ask questions. We will get back to you. Oh, excellent. I didn't know that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of resources on our website, Dawn, that you'll find useful and previous, previous webinars that you can look at. And that's Kern firesafe.org that's right all right excellent thank you You're and well. for everyone who's who's watching who you may come up with a question later you can always write that into the chat or into the uh at the website and they will get back with you uh with an answer also yeah and i just want to tag in one one comment on on that um, one thing that I've seen in my experience and one thing that's very important to do is to harden your house aside from the fire um, clearances and not storing, you know, stuff that will catch fire around your house is to try to um, seal things up um, because what happens in a fire is that there's always winds in a fire and winds um, blow what we call fire brands or it's basically embers and uh, winds can carry those quite some distance. And a lot of times what happens is um, these um, embers or fire brands can get lodged in something or land underneath something. Um, and that can be just enough to, um, to catch a house on fire. So an example of that is if you have wood siding and um, you have cracks or crevices in, in your siding, it's a good idea to seal those with something. Because if you get a hot enough ember in right conditions that lodge in there, that could cause an ignition. Um, another point is like um, vents on the house. Um, a lot of times they don't have any type of screening. They just have like a wire mesh. Well, that wire mesh is big enough for um, embers to blow into. So if any embers blow into your like attic or crawl space, um, that could be enough to start a fire. Um, another thing to think about is if you have a porch or a deck, um, have you cleaned underneath it? Um, leaves and pine needles can blow underneath there, but have you raked those out? If not, um, same thing, you know, uh, embers or, or fire brands can blow underneath there and that could be enough to, to, to start an ignition. So just something to think about to, to do in hardening, um, the, uh, the fire clearances and the things, to, uh, on your houses. You said for the, uh, the clearance, uh, uh, for vegetation around your house, um, when we, when I start taking that stuff out, do I take it down to, to dirt? Um, yeah, dirt is is um, best if you can do that because dirt doesn't burn. Okay. Yeah, because okay, the the mulch, the slash that we can put on the ground, some people will put it in their yard, and that becomes problematic <clears throat> um, with with fire. Then yes, it, it can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Chris, these are the kinds of things what you were just talking about. This is what we're looking to identify right, by right. doing these assessments. They're pretty comprehensive assessments, and homeowners get um, a report with recommendations on it. And I think that that's really helpful. And people that can do the work uh, and get that done have a better chance to save their home if a yeah. fire does come through. Julia, it's Don. A question your website probably will say, is there a fee for that assessment? No, it's totally mm -hmm. free. Wow. It's totally free. And the, the other thing that um, we were told by Team Rubicon is that they were informed that there will be a grant coming either the end of this year or next spring to actually help homeowners do some of the work that needs to be done. So there'll be money to help the homeowners that can't afford it. Oh, excellent, excellent. I've got one of those, I think it was built in, I wanna say 73. Yeah, no, yeah, no, and your no, home yeah. really should be assessed. Wow, well, this is, Chris, this has been great. This has really been something. 
you know, to have a to have a Q and A while we're while we're going through it is a different thing. But um, um, I hope all questions have been asked and answered. And if uh, if people think about them uh, and want to uh, bring something up, then please uh, enter it onto the website, and they will get back as quickly as they can with an answer. And uh, we're running out of time. We got about Wait. two minutes. We have one more question. Can we do that? Okay. 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 Sure. So, um, Despina. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Sorry, I mispronounced. Yeah. No worries. It. No worries. Sorry. A quick question about the assessment you mentioned. Sorry, I was a tiny bit distracted. And I wasn't sure if you mentioned that. Is it an assessment after we do the clearance, or is it before? Are you trying to make sure that we did a good job, or? You're trying to guide us on what to do. Sorry, I wasn't um, clear, and it's my fault because I wasn't was a little no, bit distracted. that's okay. Yes, mentioned. the assessment will look at your home and give you suggestions on things that you can do to harden it, and then it's not being reported to any agency. You're not going to get any fines for anything that wasn't done. This is just for your benefit, and we are collecting the data from it, but we're not attaching the data to anybody's address or anything like that. Um, the data will be used for future grants to ask for money to make some of these corrections. Excellent. Thank you so much for the clarification. Yes. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody for your questions. It was great. Um, and there are deep thanks to uh, Chris, uh, Sir Jeff, for getting his time, talent, and expertise to illuminate for us what each and every one of us needs to be aware of uh, living in the fire danger areas. Our current webs, our website, kernfiresafe.org, has a section where you can voice your concerns. Uh, you can ask questions and give advice. Also, if you have a topic for a webinar, uh, let us know, and uh, we'll, we will want to reach as many people as we can. But uh, that said, there are many resources on the website uh, to help you, and your feedback is welcome. So you can also view. Our previous webinars there, there have been a plethora of them. Uh, but just to let you know what's coming in the future, the next webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, the next webinar is May 23rd at 5 p.m. on Zoom with Tom Crow of the American Red Cross. And so you can uh, you can get information about that. That is also uh, very important. But uh, with all that said, uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, Julia, thank you. It's great to see you. And uh, I'm David Stenstrom, and we all wish you a very pleasant good night, and thank you for being here.